Joining me today is Matt Smith. Hello, Matt. Hi, Ruth. How are you? Well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, just dodging the showers uh, at the moment in the northwest uh, of England and uh, just having a little bit of kind of off football season uh, family time. So a nice, nice part of the uh, time of the year for me in, in some ways. I know it's been uh, a really dodgy day today, hasn't it? Our dog sensed when uh, it was okay to go out for a walk and he sat there with his tail wagging, let's go for a walk. So we nipped out quick and as we got back, it just started to rain. Yeah, so, good timing. Good timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just done similar with my uh, equivalent of a dog, which is my teenage son. So I've just stretched his legs. <laughs> At least your teenage son will be quiet in the background. I can't guarantee it again. Well, I wouldn't guarantee that either. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see how we go. <laughs> Now, not wishing to make either of us feel old, but I remember you presenting the sports news for BBC Television News. And since then, you've presented football shows for uh, ITV Digital and BT Sport. And Drew and I saw you this weekend doing, Drew's my husband, uh, Drew and I saw you this weekend um, anchoring a tennis show for Eurosport. And we've seen you doing the snooker there as well. So. I guess my first question is, how do you become so versatile so that you can cover all these different sports? Yeah, that is a good question. I don't know, really. I suppose just enthusiasm and willingness, really, and an interest in a number of, of sports. I mean, from a professional point of view, I have always uh, mainly worked in and on football, uh, partly because clearly that's the biggest sport uh, in the country. Um, and probably globally for that matter. So it is the one that generates the most work. Mm. Um, so that has always been, and then in, in all fairness, it is the one I am probably most um, involved in and therefore interested in uh, and have the most knowledge of. So I am more employable on that front. But I would say generally I've always been a sports fan um, and albeit my, my kind of professional broadcasting career didn't start in sports, when it did switch to sport, I did have a quite a wide interest in the sport. And when I worked at the BBC, they were more than happy. And it's a kind of, I suppose it's a, it's a BBC uh, habit to try and push you in a few different directions and see where you're comfortable and, and what, what they oh, see you doing and so on. So they're good like that. It's quite a broad church. Um, so with one or two exceptions that, that I just don't have the knowledge to, to justify uh, a professional presence in. So really horse racing, I know nothing about and never had an interest in. So that's something I've never worked on. Um, and I have limited kind of either enthusiasm or knowledge of motorsports in truth. Um, so I've not ever much worked on that. But but other than that, I've worked on, yeah, you're right, a lot of sport, obviously football, but done an Olympics, uh, an Ashes cricket tour. Um, gosh, yeah, tennis, snooker, uh, rugby, boxing. Quite a, yeah, quite a broad remit, really, which is it's just been nice to be honest it keeps keeps you on your toes and kind of makes the job ever fresh and interesting certainly from my point of view mm, i was going to say ever fresh so something like the olympics how do you prepare for that because i mean there's so many sports within that yes i mean you do get a little bit of a steer before it starts as to which part or which sport you're going to to cover so i don't think anybody would be expected to to cover every sport in the the two or three weeks that the Olympics would go on because you just couldn't hold that amount of uh, information in your head, really. But I think as a, as a kind of general rule in, in, in my job, there's an element of, of course, always preparing day by day for the sports that you cover. Uh, um, but also that you develop that ability to kind of ingest information, then almost kind of compartmentalise and chuck it away when you've finished needing it. Right. So a little bit of a sieve. So it's you, the kind of, you know, the, the the water for the pasta is poured, you know, from and through and away from the sieve and all that's left is the, is the pasta. So um, it's not a very good analogy, but what I'm trying to say is, yeah, you kind of, you take in the information that you need, you, you use it. And then when you move on to the next thing, you, you develop um, something of an ability to, to drain away what you no longer need at your fingertips. So, you, you, yeah, you, you compartmentalise quite, quite a lot, I think. Mm. But so if you do um, a season on football, but you're throwing in other things like where the cricket season overlaps with the football um, and if there's boxing matches as well, to just kind of be able to switch between the two in the same week, perhaps, must be tricky. I suppose so, although it's no different in some ways, is it, to, I suppose, a news uh, broadcaster or journalist or presenter who is faced with different topics, literally different topics 
every day in a number of different topics. Obviously, some recur, but others come and go in a single day or, or perhaps a week. If there's a volcano or a tragedy somewhere in the world, then obviously they focus in on that and they, they generate uh, information from those that can serve them. Obviously, we're in you know the internet age now, so it's very easy yes. to assimilate information quite quickly online. Um, so you can look stuff up and become the kind of in inverted commas, instant expert. Now, it isn't quite like that, obviously, in sport, because you're hoping to have a better knowledge than just the, the last few hours at, yeah. at your disposal. But equally, you're not ever, I don't think, trying to come across as, as the equivalent of a pundit in, in this. You haven't had a career in that sport. So there is always an element of the observer. It's yeah. just the journalistic side to the job, really, isn't it? The, your, your ability to be slightly detached as well as interested so observe from something of a distance and then that informs your enthusiasm and your willingness to learn by way of obviously asking those that are either doing or have done the sport that you're covering. Yeah, yeah. And, and I suppose knowing how much information you need to take in for each thing rather than, you know, if you're a commentator, say you might need all those facts at your fingertips mm. all the time. But as a presenter, perhaps just knowing the important questions to ask if you guess. Yes, exactly. So I think like um, has probably been been put several times before and would apply to a number of jobs. There's a bit of an element of a duck on the surface looking quite serene as it glides across a body of water but underneath <laughs> yes. all the efforts happening. You do kind of have, as I said earlier, you have these little compartments slightly in your head when you're, you're particularly in a, in a live setting where, yes, there's quite a lot swirling around in the back of your mind about the things that you might have read about or tried to, to generate background information on and then you're you're kind of plucking from that small library the elements that seem applicable as a conversation or an event unfold so you're just looking for the narrative that will steer you through that whether that, if that's obviously a conversation with a pundit in relation to a live event you're trying to think right what are the key elements that we're trying to get across to the audience here what are the right questions to illustrate what we've just seen to add value to what we've just seen or are seeing um, but yeah, my job is often obviously beginning, middle and end in, in a lot of sporting contexts in, in a way that the commentator obviously has a very different job mm -hmm. in that the sport is unfolding there and then. So I have a slight more chance to reflect and try and condense the, the event into the digestible or understandable chunks that, that the folks can, can have at home and then take away from the broadcast, I suppose. Yeah, OK. Um, you said that, you know, sport wasn't your first thing that you did in journalism. So what was your route in? So it was it was all a bit accidental um, in as much as I didn't really have a very clear idea it, while I was doing a languages and politics degree in Sheffield, what that would lead to. I had a vague notion of travelling, obviously, with the languages background. Uh, so that that was something that interested me. And then I had a kind of pretty unsubstantiated idea of maybe uh, some kind of foreign correspondence role. So I, I did a little bit of writing for the student newspaper in Sheffield, and that was literally just, just you know, was, I just thought it might be quite interesting, really. Nothing sporting, just on kind of local topics or things that interest me, you know, concerts I'd been to, concert reviews, that kind of stuff, just bits and pieces. Then on the back of that, which is not much at all, as my degree came to an end, the four years uh, in Sheffield and, and France and Italy, which were my two languages, I, I wrote to the correspondents whose names I could find of the English newspapers in Rome. And to their eternal credit, several of them wrote back and said, look, I haven't got an actual job, but if you come and make yourself known to me, you know, I, there will be work running around, you know, helping out. So that's what I did. I just went on spec at the end of my degree and um, got a start, do bits and pieces for, for one or two people. And then that led to a, a traineeship at Associated Press, a big American press agency, which had a bureau in, in Rome. And from that, then I got a few more contacts and started working for a wider selection of magazines and newspapers. And then one of them, the Financial Times, said to me, if you come back to the UK, you, you can get a proper training rather than the bits and pieces that you're picking up on the road. You'll need at one point or another to get a, a better preparation to, to, to make this step to the more senior roles. So I did. I came back and moved to London. And worked in the FT, that led to a foreign affairs um, position. Uh, and then out of the blue, really, I got an opportunity through someone I kn knew to work on a foreign affairs series for Channel 4. We were looking for kind of, you know, new, younger um, 
associate, associate and assistant producers and, and reporters to work on that show. So that was my first taste of television. That then led to um, a breakfast news job at the BBC. Uh, and then I worked in the news at the BBC until I got um, the opportunity, which kind of just came about by accident to work in the sports department. And yeah, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> But that um, those early days in Rome, where you were, you know, working for other journalists, just doing odd little jobs, that must have been great grounding for you. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really know what 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 I was doing, to be honest. So I just did whatever anyone asked me to do, you know. But it was a kind of interesting time because um, this was round about 1990. So there was a lot going on with um, the obviously the fall of the Soviet Union. So Gorbachev, I remember, came and he he not only met the then Italian prime minister and president, but also the Pope. Right. Um, so I remember covering that because they wanted obviously as many angles as, as they could generate really, particularly for an American audience. I remember writing in all different types of copy um, that would go into the, the senior journalist article. So I was, you know, just, just the dog's body in lots of ways. It wasn't like I was getting these great long, you know, articles of my own, but it was a real learning curve as to how to, you know, literally kind of, dash around a city, picking up tidbits of information, thinking about how to source elements of a story, who to talk to, the channels that you'd go through officially if you wanted to talk to, for instance, the Prime Minister's office, there'd be obviously a, a press department and you would look for a quote or a line or some information from them. What was you, you were always working in that field ahead of time. So you're always working to a kind of calendar for the next week or the next month, looking for key elements like a, a state visit or, I don't know, um, the opening of a big new shopping centre or whatever it might be. And then, of course, it would be the daily stuff that would have no um, predictability, like an accident or a train crash or something, obviously, of a, of a more, um, yeah, day-to-day -day journalistic um, necessary coverage point of view, really. So yeah, I learned a lot in, a, in quite a short time, and um, and learned how different outlets, different organs, different um, newspapers and, and magazines want quite different things, want different styles, different lengths, different language, etc. So I went to cover a film festival for Variety, the American film magazine, and they almost have their own language. They have Hi. their own kind of weird, kind of industry specialized way of writing and, and describing not only right. film, but also all the people that work around the film industry. So, um, yeah, you get, for instance, you, you, they, they don't talk about someone directing a film, they talk to, about someone helming a project or a film unspooling. They had all these weird kind of colourful descriptions of stuff. So, yeah, it was, it, was, it was fun times. Obviously, I was, you know, in my early 20s, just, you know, just loving life, really, just thinking nothing of it, just having a ball. Yeah, I know, but it must have been really good experience to learn, you know, how to write or shape things for different audiences and different um, newspapers. And I take it when you say in terms of language, you mean like if it was perhaps a red top newspaper, they would want it written differently to say a broadsheet. Yeah, I mean, I didn't do much because obviously, you know, based in Italy, there wasn't a lot of interest in the British tabloids for anything much that came out of Italy. So I didn't really do any of that. But even from someone like, let's say, if I did something for the Financial Times or something for the Observer or something for, I don't know, the New York Times, because there was th those kind of newspapers that would be interested in the world at large and therefore yes. whatever was going on in, in Italy. Um, but, but also the different nationalities in the English speaking world, which is what I was working for at that point, um, the odd Canadian or Australian, um, newspaper or magazine, yeah, they'd all want their own angle, and they'd always want to tr obviously try and make it um, connected in whatever way it could be back to to them or someone who yes, was a Canadian in in Rome. Of course, then the Canadian newspaper would want to know about that particular angle. Obviously, the Americans would always want an American angle if they could find one. Um, the FT would want actually, interestingly, they wouldn't always be a business perspective. Because they had quite a big foreign affairs section. They, I think they had then the second biggest number of foreign correspondents in, in the world of English speaking newspapers behind the New York Times, actually. Nice. So, yeah, so they were big on that. It wasn't just that they wanted stuff about the stock market or whatever was going mm. on in a business sense in, in Italy, although they wanted that as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, interesting. It was, it was, it was a big learning curve. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I bet it was good fun. Yeah. It was, and then my my then girlfriend, who's my my, my now wife, who because we studied together and met at, at Sheffield, 
Um, right. She then had studied uh, a TEFL course after she graduated at the same time as me. So she then got a job in La Spezia, which is up the coast uh, near Genoa, up the, the west coast of Italy, above Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, so she came out to teach there and I went up and, and we, we got a flat and rented a flat in, in Las Petit. So I just travelled around from that base rather than from being based in Rome. So did a bit of dashing about and did a bit of translating and stuff as well to kind of try and make ends meet. And then, as I say, uh, after a year or two of that, uh, the opportunity came to come back and get started proper training at, at the Financial Times. And, and uh, Fiona was happy to come back and start to teach uh, French and Italian back here rather than English in Italy. Over there, yes. Yeah. yeah, and she's still a teacher now. Fantastic. Mm. Um, so the FT, you came back and you worked for them. Um, I've lost what I was going to ask you. We were just talking about it. It was, um, you said that they said you should come back and get more of a formal training. So yeah. So you could move forward. But what does that formal training consist of? Was it exams well, or? No, it wasn't. I don't think there was any, because they used to do a, a system called indentures, didn't they, to be um, qualified as a, as a newspaper journalist. Um, right. And then obviously it became things like NCTJ courses came about and so on. So yeah. I, I never actually got around to doing any of those. I did learn a bit of shorthand, but but never actually ended up needing it very often anyway, because it's most useful really at things like press conferences or mm. um, things where you obviously you need to get information down onto the page quickly. But Obviously, my, my career went in a slightly different direction. But, yeah, I got back to the FT and, yeah, had, had a great kind of few, it was only probably, a, I don't know, maybe six months to a year uh, on Southwark Bridge where the FT is and was based. Uh, again, you know, lot, met a lot of interesting people, really enjoyed it. But I'd kind of thought I'd be back in London for, I don't know, maybe a year and then I'd be sent off somewhere interesting, hope, hoping it might be Italy. But, you know, I was yeah. kind of fairly flexible. But it quickly became apparent that actually that was going to be like maybe five years or more, you know, because uh, okay. those posts were obviously very sought after and there was yes. a working order. And, you know, in my typical naivety and probably, you know, slight, you know, big headedness thought, well, I'll just, you know, somehow jump the queue. Well, there was little chance of that. But <laughs> as, luck, as luck would have it, as I say, through a kind of uh, uh, someone I've got to know, uh, it, it, it became apparent that there was a chance to work on this foreign affairs TV series and obviously I had no no expertise and no knowledge at all of broadcast but it was so thrown into the deep end a little bit but um yeah suddenly I was going off to do um because they wanted to generate kind of left field stories so the first one I'd kind of dug up which I thought was of interest really was I'd read an article in a quite obscure magazine about this uh, Rastafarian camp in Ethiopia in a little village called Sheshamani uh, so there were um wrestlers from Britain but also from other parts of the world who'd set up a permanent camp in this village because it's got special religious significance mm -hmm. um, for those that follow that religion obviously Ethiopia with the highly Selassie connection and so on so it was a chance to go and make an interesting I thought little report about not only their beliefs but obviously it was going to hopefully look great and be quite you know left of centre not a very reported um, part of the world or story etc so I set it all up and of course it, it was chaotic when, when we actually went to do it, but we did, we got, we got something out of it. So again, you know, big learning curve and, and yeah, good fun, not without its, its moments of, of uh, worry and chaos, but that's, that's the life uh, of a traveling journey, I suppose at times. Yeah, I suppose it is. Um, how scary was it when you kind of made the move from written to broadcast and you're suddenly in front of a camera or did you just take to it like a duck to water? Um, I don't know really. I don't. I don't remember feeling um, one way or another about it. Obviously, there must have been moments where I, you know, I had to kind of get used to speaking down a camera lens and and um, trying to find words and, and so on. It is a different skill set in some ways, mm -hmm. obviously, to to the written word. It's not quite as reflective. It, so I suppose some broadcast pieces can be more in the way of a, of a, a written article in that kind of more considered piece. But by and large. It's not, you're obviously trying to marry words to pictures, uh, certainly in television, if not um, radio, which again is a, is a slightly different field again, really more conversational and, and yes. so on. But uh, you, you kind of, you, you learn as you go and you, 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 it's not a case of sink or swim because obviously you get, you get a lot of help from, from people. And um, yeah, I think it, it, it's great in the sense that there's a lot of energy, enthusiasm um, and, and interest in that sphere because the people that are doing it generally are doing it because they are enjoying it. Uh, they've got a lot of, you know, get up and go. They're all keen to kind of get on and try and make the best thing possible. And 
I, I often repeat the mantra that has always appealed to me, which I think is definitely the case, which is that um, in broadcast, and particularly television, because so many people tend to be involved, that it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. And the more pieces you can put in the right place and everybody plays their part, if you like, then the better the programme will be. Mm. It rarely should be or, or, or works best if it's centres around one or two people, you know. So I'm very much keen on the idea that it's a, it's a team effort and from the team effort comes the best outcome. Mm. And which do you prefer or do you not have a preference on live television, which is, you know, what you do a lot of, or something that you've pre-recorded and goes out at a later date? Well, I've done a lot more live, uh, obviously because of the way sport is, particularly, mm. uh, and news for that matter, really. Um, I learned a lot making uh, reports um, for for news and for that matter, to some extent for, for sport. So I did learn both technically and kind of journalistically how to put a story line together and to try and tell a story. Um, but I'd have to say, I prefer the live, not not least because um, I think there's an element of uh, stepping up to the plate with with live, and and I suppose you develop your skills to cope with that. But also, there's a there's a nice there's a comfort in delivering to the best of your ability with the preparations that we've talked about, and then when it's over, there's nothing else you can do. You know, it's gone. Yeah. Uh, there's a kind of there is a kind of um, pleasure in that that it's it, it can't be fussed over anymore because I think you can get into um the, the kind of never-ending polishing process if you're not careful with the with the yes. pre-recorded stuff you know and obviously that is a is a great skill and, and um in a documentary maker or a or a feature filmmaker then that that is something that obviously if you have that that mind then you can make incredible pieces of of uh, very watchable tv or film but I guess it's just so happens that I've ended up in the live direction because maybe that that is either who I am or what I've learned. I just think that's yeah, just the way the road took me really. Yeah, and there's a very different kind of energy when it's live, isn't it? Because there's no second chance. You've got to get it right first time. Yeah, and learn that you know it's not it's not you're not striving for perfection as such. You're just striving for the best that can be achieved in that moment. Be you're trying to be flexible. Be um reactive obviously uh be personable with the folks you're working with in front and behind the camera talks about that team effort thing um and yeah trying to you're kind of on your toes really aren't you you're trying to you know trying to dance uh in whichever yeah. direction the, the, the story takes you you know uh whether it suddenly starts pouring with rain or suddenly a fence comes over and there's a crowd all over the pitch or whatever it might be you know you're trying to react to, to those moments that that make live tv yeah okay it can be a bit nerve-wracking but but with the that comes the adrenaline and then obviously with that yes. comes the the, the 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 relief really more than the pleasure of of um of getting to the, the finishing line yeah <laughs> going home yeah yeah no absolutely i mean i could never have done a, a presenting job because i would have found it too stressful i was right. so much happier you know kind of behind the camera they were doing the production stuff it was I, I used to look at you and think, I don't know how you could do it. I would be so stressed all Saturday afternoon waiting for, you know, the cameras to start running. It just, it wasn't my skill set, but you just kind of were so calm and relaxed. Well, I mean, I think obviously there's an element of that just happens to be someone's personality, but there is also a learned skill that goes with that. There's an experience that obviously once you've done a, let's say a handful, maybe not, not one, but, but a few, and actually like most things in life, the things when they go wrong are pretty useful uh trials by fire really you know what I mean as long as you emerge somehow on somewhat unscathed then those are the things that really educate you a lot as to how to cope and and to not be too panic stricken by things going wrong because they do I mean, obviously they do mm. they do go wrong uh, either by design or by accident they they it, it happens so yeah I think there is a combination of personality and and uh, experience but and the two things are obviously both very useful but um yeah I wouldn't I I suppose the skill really, I think, the skill is in making it look like it's not chaotic when it probably is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, I do, yeah. Yeah. I think it's very interesting to hear you say it's not to, you know, strive for perfection. It's to just, you know, accept that you just do your best. 
mm. because I think certainly when you're younger that's kind of all you're focused on is is trying to get perfection and then kind of for me anyway um, you know kind of really telling yourself off when something doesn't you know go perfectly but really there is no perfect especially when it's mine it's just you know you just have to roll with it really yeah and of course your idea of perfection might not be somebody else's it certainly might not be the viewers um so there's that as well so every, we're all editorializing aren't we through life let alone through the prism of a camera and, and and a microphone um so the fact that you might be ecstatically happy with something whether it was recorded or or, or live that doesn't necessarily mean the person next to you or, or the person watching it in their lounge thinks you know you did a great job so you have to cope with the brickbats a, a little bit that will go obviously in this era more than any, than when we started we're now you know if you want to be and you don't have to be but but nonetheless you sense that there is opinion all around you on what what you do and it's that kind of job uh, and that I suppose you have to adapt to that or, or find a way to cope with that in a way that maybe I suppose other performers have always had to cope with that either you develop a thick skin or you ignore it or I don't and know what do you do uh, I, I pretty much ignore it <laughs> Um, yeah. I'm not a massive presence on social media. I, I understand its value and uh, certainly don't think it's going away, but I, I, I don't particularly feel drawn to uh, looking for uh, kind of um, approval um, that way. I, I'm not sure that's very constructive for, 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 for me or anyone who does a job like mine, really. I don't know. Um, I think you know who you need to um turn to for either support or critique or whatever mm. it is that you, you you need and look for but it, it isn't probably uh social media no people that don't know you no well or, and then don't know what the job entailed or, or what was happening yes. at that time that meant that yes of course it was imperfect and we, we would never i don't think any of us would, would claim you know well i did a you know brilliant job and how dare you criticize we, you all take constructive criticism but but obviously it's an imperfect delivery, an imperfect job, as we've discussed. So if you're not around that job, then maybe you're not fully um, equipped to, to offer a, a genuine, you know, criticism of the way it was done. Yeah, that, that's very true, because what people probably don't know is um, that aren't involved in the television world, that a presenter is sat there with an earpiece, and although that earpiece may well be visible to the viewer, someone is constantly talking in your ear from the uh, program editor that sat in the gallery with the banks of television screens to the production assistant who's counting you in for all your different pieces there's always somebody in your ear talking whilst you're talking to people in the studio mm. and I think that's a skill in itself to be able to speak to your guests whilst you've got someone talking in your ear and telling you something important that you've got to take in and then you know bring that into either the conversation or leave the time for another segment to be played in yeah i mean again it's a learned skill something you, you you get used to um some folks uh like what we call switch talk back which obviously you'll know but for those watching that means they only hear what they need to hear essentially uh but most i think and certainly i in in a live environment would normally prefer what would call, be called open talk back so you hear everything that's happening behind the scenes because by and large, it's useful to hear things slightly ahead of time. So if you can hear that there's a potential that, let's say, the next piece that you're going to go to isn't ready or whatever it might be, or the, a camera's found there's a story developing because there might be some violence in the crowd or a player's gone down off the ball or whatever it might be, um, you're already your brain's ticking, thinking, right, you know, what do I do with that information? How do I bring that, you know, to the people in the studio, but also to, to down the length of the people at, at home um so yeah it, that that is a, a learned skill i mean i'm sure people in a lot of walks of life in a lot of jobs uh, it's just an element of plate spinning isn't it or compartmentalizing that brain uh, it is, as, yeah. as we've discussed you know and, and people probably do that that all the time they're thinking whilst they're sat at a desk i don't know trying to sell a car to john they're also thinking well i had that conversation with dave earlier he might come back and buy that other car from me and so they're doing the same thing it's just you know Yes, it's a slightly high pressure environment, but um, I suppose, you know, a lot of jobs are like that, really. It's just this is the one that you and I know about. That's true, but it's the one that most people can see at the same time. You know, you can have a, yeah, you're on a display, huge yeah. audience. Yeah. You're but on one thing um, that you always did, and I don't know if you're, you're the only presenter I've worked with that's been able to do it, 
that when the show is being counted down at the end for you to close to do your extra to say you know goodbye and whatever it is that you're about to say and the production assistants in your ear counting you down from 10 to zero and you need to be out because obviously there's adverts in the next program you were the only presenter i've worked with that was always out on you know on time without going over and it was yeah, just, yeah. and i think that's well, quite the skill uh, yeah again i suppose it's experience but the, 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 the it's not even a trick but the kind of method that I use in that scenario is obviously you, you, what you need is a bit of flexibility there, obviously, because you don't always know how long you're going to have. You try and construct an end to a programme, don't you, where, where the guests are going to stop talking roughly around this time, then we might put a promo for what's going to be happening next week or next programme or whatever. And then and it might be, you know, left with something like 10 or 15 seconds to say thank you and, and nice to have your company and see you next week. And that broadly is how it works. But mm -hmm. of course, it doesn't always pan out quite like that because the guest speaks for a bit longer or suddenly something comes up right in the deck or the graphic doesn't work or whatever. So I tend to think of some kind of final thought, quite simple, uh, but normally that it has two or three layers to it that can be extended or condensed mm -hmm. however much they need to be, you know? So it, to try and sum up what we've just all witnessed for the last two hours in a football match, let's say, you know, great game tonight or, you know, average game tonight, whatever. You know, here's a couple of the thoughts that probably sum up the key moments in the game and maybe here's a key player that, that you know, decides the game tonight and maybe what this will mean for next week. So there's probably three or four thoughts that could either all be used or only one of those be used in order to make the time fit what's left, if, if that yes. makes sense. Yes, and you were just doing it then because you clicked into that mode, you could see and you could hear... <laughs> that you were just kind of extending your words slightly in the pauses between. And, and that yeah. was what you're so good at. You either kind of extend them or you close them up depending on what the countdown is in your ear. But it's not evident to someone watching that like, oh, you know, Matt's kind of going really quickly because there's only so much time left. Yeah. You've managed to get that lovely kind of uh, rhythm of either closing it down quickly or extending it a little without it being obvious that you're just padding a little for time. Yeah, and again, I guess that's just, that's just a bit of experience, really, in working out with trial and error, really, and, and success and failure, um, you know, what works for you, because obviously different people will find different things work for them, that's not, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution for sure, you know, mm -hmm. some people want it very much like a scripted ending, and, and they need it all to fall into place so they can do their last couple of lines, but I pretty much, for the last however many years, uh, don't often really don't have auto cue, so you can't do that. You know, no. so um, and I think you, what I try and say to, to some youngsters who, who sometimes ask for advice is I wouldn't get too scripted on a live program wherever possible. Try and think of the idea and then let the words come if you can and, and practice that because it will be a much more reliable stick for you than trying to remember every word. Because if you suddenly misstep one word, you'll panic or freeze or, or lose your train of thought or whatever it might be you know yes. it'll unravel quickly whereas you're just trying to find a way to say basically great game and didn't Paul Pogba play well and maybe he's turned a corner and you know maybe Fernandez is the guy that's going to turn him into the world-class player we've all known and we'll find out next week won't we you know whatever it might be you know just let those words come to the idea rather than it being a very scripted and polished performance that makes sense yeah you, you touch on advice that you um, give to people. I saw that you did an interview recently for the Future Journalists Award at Staffordshire University and you talked there about some of the problems with social media of kind of um, seeing something, regurgitating it without kind of verifying its source and seeing if it's, you know, um, actually true before mm. you start telling people what you've seen. How much of a problem or a difficulty does social media give you when you're doing your own research for programs um yeah it, as, as i say i think it's useful for what it is as long as you know its limitations really it's not uh, often um a primary source although that said it can often be i think these days a very quick way to ascertain what people are talking about or mm. what they've heard might be true but obviously if you're live on air you can't just start regurgitating what you might be seeing on on your phone or a screen nearby without thinking at least if not getting the team behind the camera to double check 
the, the, the veracity of, of what you know what might be unfolding. Yes. Because you obviously you have a duty to the audience to either not you know, panic them or misinform them or um, wildly speculate. I mean, just for instance, the obvious example in recent weeks of the Christine Eriksen scenario. Um, mm. And that's a very, very difficult situation, obviously, not least because you're left in a situation where as broadcasters, you're trying to find words and there aren't many words that actually fit very well what's happening. You don't want to speculate. No. You don't want to keep really, and again, there was quite a debate, wasn't there, that you don't really want to train the cameras on what, what is happening. Um, so you're then trying to find a way to stay near but not on the subject and, and the actual story for, for obvious reasons, for, for dignity and privacy and, and, and quite right that after a bit of wireism, they, they obviously did cut away. Um, and interesting that the players formed that shield, I think as much for the crowd yes. in the stadium as the, as the cameras, but yeah. just that sense of protecting their, their teammate was, was quite an interesting human insight, wasn't it, I suppose. But, but from my point of view, a very difficult job for all those doing what, what we do uh, in that scenario, because yeah, you're left trying to find words that, that there aren't really many words that, that are very helpful. You're not medical, so you can't start talking about the. the, the and anyway, you, you don't know what's happening. Even if you had a medical training, how can you talk about what's happening or what has or hasn't happened to Christian Eriksen when you don't know? No. So unless you're there by his side, you can't deliver any kind of facts. Um, so you end up regurgitating the same, you, you, you're repeating the same mantra about hope he's okay and, you know, isn't this awful? And, and obviously you can start sounding quite ridiculous quite quickly. And that's, you're conscious that you don't want to say anything that the audience would take um and and misuse uh because you don't want to be uh you don't know who's watching it might be a member of his family or, or yes that's true yeah could be anything so or anyone so you have to be very careful with that um and those situations are, are particularly difficult that is an extreme example obviously but but yeah they, they, on a smaller scale clearly social media can can suggest and sometimes almost break news but you need to i think just be conscious of of the veracity or the reliability of the source um if there's video evidence let's say that obviously people often now with their phones can film stuff and then you can see for yourself what may or may not be happening and you can mm. find words to try and back that up um but yeah it, it's just it, you have to insulate yourself a little bit from what can be a slightly hysterical cauldron uh, i think social media at times yeah i i think it is or it can be um, and the other advice you gave them was to be yourself Mm. rather than you know putting on an act and i guess that kind of what you were just talking about how you kind of react to something very serious that's going on like that on a pitch you know not to kind of overreact but just treat them as if it was someone you know one of your family yeah i do i do think um it is important to be yourself um because i think once you start even one step down the road of trying to be a persona however kind of constructed that is then, then you've you've got that, that that's good you're gonna have to continue with that aren't you forever mm -hmm. uh so that's fine if you're obviously if you're a comedian or an actor um playing a part or or you particularly uh, in a different sphere of, of performance you want to project a certain version of either yourself or whoever this ever whatever this construct is um that, that you think will give people a laugh or be entertaining in some way or whatever but that's not really the job i don't think that i do um, some are louder than others, some are more forceful than others, but my job, in my opinion, is to make other people seem interesting and, um, and, and informed um, and, and get that information across to the audience. You're a conduit, really, rather than it being about you. It's not, it shouldn't and doesn't need to be about, about you, I think. You're, you're there to make everything else work, really. That's, that's how I see it. That may mm. not be everyone sees it in fair dues but that's that's you know my my sense of what my job is is is, is that really mm, i think that's a really nice way of looking at it um so what advice would you give to people that want to break into journalism because it's changed a lot since we started yeah it has it has and obviously the advent of social media has been very uh, opportunity uh, rich hasn't it in lots of ways for young people that the, the the platform now is so much wider than than it was, but it's also quite difficult to be seen because uh, because the platform is so wide. Mm. How do you get people to notice what you're doing? You know, unless you're working for one of the traditional 
outlets and, and even they have now been somewhat diluted because the audience is so broad. I mean, I don't know about you. I've got, you know, my two kids, I don't know how much TV they even watch now. You know, they watch everything uh, that they, well, not everything, but a vast proportion of what they um, digest is through their screens, through their laptops and phones. Mm. And that could be YouTube, obviously could be social media, could be, obviously it could be traditional format programs on catch up services, or potentially even live as well with internet mm. access and so on. So, but they have a plethora of choices, uh, but they're not certainly not dictated to by TV schedules in the way that maybe we were in previous generations were. Um, so I think it, it is a great time, but also a difficult time for young people. Uh, so my my advice would be to yeah be yourself um be enthusiastic be be a very much a sponge to, to to try and learn from those that are already doing whatever it is that you want to do within that that industry be persistent because the opportunities are hard to come by so don't be too downhearted uh, which is easier said than done by by any rejections you might suffer get as much experience as you can practice so all those little things that we've talked about like the way to end a program or how to find your way through uh, a very difficult situation like the Christine Erickson one or a power failure or whatever it would be that would throw all the plans uh, out of kilter. The more you can mentally prepare, if you like, for those, which is hard, but but nonetheless, you will you will come through them better than those that haven't. You just you just will because preparation is is very vitally important. It really is. The more knowledgeable you are, the more you can guide a conversation in myriad directions, which will get you through uh the difficult times where the sport isn't happening you know you've come on to a football match you've got a guest next to you but the floodlights have gone and we need half an hour before the players are going to come out well the more prep you've done the more you can have a chat with that person because they're going to look to you and say right what are we doing yes. they're going to just take over and no one else in the gallery behind they can't come on the camera and say we're going to do this now all they can do is tell you what they would hope you know to achieve with that half an hour and then it's on you to try and basically carry that program through the murky waters of the next 30 minutes uh, and that's happened to me quite a lot so mm. um yeah of course you learn uh, but but equally um the more prep you've done the more chance you've got that's great advice matt so just kind of pra because you can do that practice at home in your bedroom or mm. wherever you are or mentally on a train or, or something like that wherever you are you can be running those scenes in your mind and thinking what you're going to say yeah. That's, great. That's really good advice. And watch, I mean, obviously, if you're into the sport or whatever, whatever whichever part of this uh, industry, if, if that's the one you're interested in, then watch what the folks on the TV do, particularly when it's clear that it's not going to plan. Because those are the, those are the bits to learn from. We'll see how they, they manage. Some, some will be good, some will be bad. Most will be good because it wouldn't be there otherwise. But, mm. but it's interesting to watch and you'll pick up little snippets of... of what they did well or perhaps what went wrong um and and yeah you can learn a lot from from that when it goes to plan obviously it's you, it's hard to see really the joins but yeah. when it goes wrong that's those are the bits to to try and try and you know record press record and then watch it back and, and see if you can pick up tidbits yeah that's interesting because it's amazing how many times you do get power cuts at grounds or games get delayed for some reason or another mm. yeah no absolutely obviously the last year has been a real kind of make do and mend situation you know it's been very very imperfect a lot of the time um without fans and with all sorts of protocols and so on and so forth i mean it's great that we've you know managed to keep the show on the road because i think it's been a happy distraction for a lot of people stuck in in their houses really uh mm. football and other sports it's it's not been straightforward but um i think we'll all be delighted that we're, we're getting crowds back uh hopefully that you know isn't isn't a, a problematic thing but um yeah it, it I think, uh, yeah, a, mil a million things can and do go slightly less well than than they are planned. So because it's yeah. live. Yeah, exactly. Life is live, and and these programs are live. So you know, yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. It's it's great. It's great. It's great fun uh, as long as you survive. <laughs> <laughs> and you have wonderfully well. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Well, you know, still kicking, still kicking. And I'm glad to see you all. Matt, thank you ever so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And uh, if you'd like to subscribe to the channel so that you get to know when uh, new interviews are up, then please do so or click like if you've enjoyed this interview. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.